Hello, my nursing students. Let's get done with this part two of chapter 22 of unit four, right? Okay, so we stopped um, because I had to get to a good place. Now I wanna talk about the lungs. All right, let's dive in there. Can you see his lungs? Aren't they beautiful? Aren't his lungs just the most amazing lungs you've ever visualized in your life? So let's talk about the lungs. The lungs are very soft or cone shaped um, organs. They contain structures of the lower respiratory system. Remember we talked about that. Lower respiratory, lower respiratory things that are encased in the thoracic cavity. Um, you have the apex, which is the top of the lungs, and then you have the base, which is the bottom. That's how we normally talk about where we hear the lung sounds that are maybe um, adventitious or something like that. Um, so in the right lung, you have three lobes, okay? You have the three lobes. You have the superior, the middle, and the inferior. And then on the left lung, you have two lobes. You have the superior and inferior. The lungs occupy most of the space in the thoracic cavity. Um, the left lung has only two lobes because it has to give way for positioning of the heart um, within the mediastinium. Medium, mediastinium, okay? Uh, please remember that the right lung has three and the left lung has two, okay? Um, removal of a lung. Can we live without one of the lungs? Look at that. Yes. Or look at that. Yes, we can live with one lung. Um, but um, the name of that procedure is a pneumectomy. Um, okay, pneumectomy. That is the removal of a lung. So let's talk about pleural membranes. Pleural membranes are the spaces, you know, there's like a thin lining where fluid lives, okay? That keeps those two linings from rubbing together, all right? So the best way I like to describe it um, is like a capsulation, right? So there's two spaces here. So the first one is the parietal pleura and the bottom is the visceral pleura. So the parietal pleura is the outer serous membrane, okay? The visceral pleura is lines the lung, so it's the one that's closest to the lung. And in between there, y'all see my thumbs? In between there is the intrapleural space, okay, between. It's located between the, uh, the parietal and the visceral pleura, okay? Um, the intrapleural space is the space between the two pleural membranes. Um, remember, it's in the middle. You saw my thumbs. It's in there. Okay. Um, negative pressure in the intrapleural space is very crucial for keeping lungs expanded. Pleural membranes secrete serous fluid. Write that down. Pleural membranes secrete serous fluid, which lubricates the pleural membrane. It lubricates it, okay? This allows them to slide past one another with little friction or discomfort, okay? So, um, some people who may have like pleurisy, that means that they have friction, right? And it causes a lot of discomfort, okay? An excess of accumulation of pleural fluid is called pleural effusion. So if there's too much fluid, that's a pleural effusion. If there's not enough, people can have pleurisy, and that is very painful. Um, it is a lack of serous fluid causing discomfort when the client inhales, okay? This can happen due to dehydration. Um, yes. And there is um, um, something called empia or empia and it's spelled e-m-p-y-e-m-a and this is when the pleural fluid has pus in it now let's talk about when a lung collapses so a collapsed lung um, can happen to people how does it happen why does it happen Okay, under normal circumstances and conditions, your lungs um, expand like balloons. Under abnormal conditions, they can collapse. 
there's two reasons for this. There is the electric, um, electric recall or the surface tension, all right? Those are the two reasonings. Now let's talk about the two reasonings. Elastic recoil. So when you think about elastic recoil, I want you to think about like a balloon. Elastic recoil is the ability for the lungs to return to an unstretched position if tension is released. So, let me explain it just a little bit further. So like if you blow up a balloon, but don't tie off the end, then the air rushes out of the balloon, which makes the balloon collapse, correct? If collapses because of arrangement of elastic fibers. When the fibers are stretched, they remain stretched, only when tension is applied. If the end of the balloon is not tied, then the elastin fibers will recoil, forcing the air out of and collapsing the balloon, okay? Show and tell. You know I like a good show and tell, right? Follow me now. see here let's make them the same size okay so these are your lungs they have tension in them they have the air in them right so this is you inhaling you inhaling so the inspiration makes them fill up with what air right so now the ends are not tied so if I was to decrease this right then you have recoil this is exhalation, nothing in them, okay? Inhalation, balloon's full. Exhalation, not so much. As we age, our elastin fibers diminish, um, you know, somewhat differently for everybody. This may cause the patient to develop shortness of breath because they just don't have the same layer and the same amount of recoil. So let's talk about surface tension. Um, surface tension, the second reason why lungs collapse. This occurs in the alveolus. It is based on water molecule uh, attraction. Um, also, it deals with surfactant, okay? A thin layer of water lines the alveolus, okay? Now, surface tension is the electrical attraction of the water molecule as the water molecule pulls on one another they make the alveolus smaller in other words they collapse the alveoli because of the negative and positive molecules the water uh, moves by osmosis which you learned earlier it moves by osmosis out of the alveoli collapsing that sac uh, then after it collapsed the water moves back into it making it more positive, which will expand it. Now let's talk a little bit about surfactant. So surfactant, you guys, is just like a um, dishwashing detergent, right? It kind of reminds me of that, okay? The slipperiness, um, that's what it reminds me of. So, surfactant is produced by cells in the alveolar wall. It reduces surface tension of the fluid that lines the alveoli. It prevents collapsing of the alveoli and ease expansion of the lungs. Um, premature infants um, lack surfactant, which is why, you know, I've had to use surfactant before, um, and this may cause them to have a collapsed lung. There are certain cells in the wall, let me just read, radiate, uh, of the alveoli which produce and secrete this surfactant, and that surfactant is really, really needed, okay? It helps to prevent the collapse of alveoli. Make sure that you retain that. Um, I 
how do I want to put this? A lot of times we just breathe to make more surfactant, okay? Water has a high surface tension, which would cause the alveoli to stick together once they recall and deflate. But due to surfactant, when they do deflate, it prevents it from collapsing closed. So it would still make it stay open like this and prevent it from closing all the way together like that. The surfactant would keep it from collapsing all the way. Every time you sigh and the surface tension builds up, the body knows to take a very deep breath. But in infants, premature infants usually have not produced enough surfactant yet. And this is the reason why they have respiratory difficulty when they are first born, when they are premature. Surfactant production around 25 weeks of gestation is when it normally starts, okay? They are usually born with collapsed lung because the minute they take that first breath they go into right that's what normally collapses them um when they're about 25 weeks gestation or less so at about 25 weeks gestation if we know that a young lady is going to go into um um premature labor we have to give her steroid that would help the body her baby uh produce surfactant um for this baby's lungs okay and then sometimes after the baby is born we have to administer some surfactant let's talk about why the lens expand there are three pressures okay the three pressures are pressure outside the check the chest which is atmosphic pressure then the pressure in the lung intrapulmonic pressure and the pressure in the intrapleural space that's intrapleural pressure. Those are the three pressures of, depending on the pressure within the intrapleural spaces of why or what ha helps the lungs expand. When P1, P2, and P3, which is the three pressures, when they are working normally and have normal pressure, the lungs will expand normally. When a hole is created in the intrapleural space, the intrapleural pressure decreases and the lung will collapse. This collapsed lung is called a pneumothorax, okay? This collapse of the lung is called a pneumothorax. Here are some things that can occur or cause a pleural neural thorax. Surgical incisions into the chest wall can make a neurothorax. Emphysema, stab wounds, gunshot wounds, or anything that penetrates the lung or hyperventilation of the lungs hyperinflation not hyperventilation hyperinflation of the lungs like when people are bag and masking somebody and they are hyperventilating them that can also cause a pneumothorax interventions that we use for a pneumothorax is a chest tube we could insert it into the intrapleural space to relieve the air uh, when the air leaves the negative pressure, it is re-established and the lungs can then expand. Um, let's talk about another puncturing or something we do to the lung to get things. Uh, uh, thorax synthesis. This is when a needle is inserted into the intrapleural space to draw out air, blood, or pus. Now let's talk about compliance of the lungs. Compliance can be compared to a balloon as well. A balloon that has never been inflated is very stiff, okay? A balloon that has been repeatedly inflated is easier to blow up because it has a loss of elasticity. The balloon that has um, been repeatedly inflated is considered more compliant, AKA more stretchy, okay? Um, and it is easier to inflate. Same as with the lungs. When compliance decreases, the lungs are very stiff. When compliance increases, the lungs are very stretchy. Conditions that are associated with the decreased compliance, so decreased compliance means not stretchy, means air cannot get in, 
or respiratory distress and uh, pulmonary edema. Conditions associated with increased compliance means air cannot get out. Or emphysema, with increased compliance, they end up having a barrel chest. That's why the emphysema clients have that really barrel looking chest. They cannot exhale their CO2 and the chest becomes more like barrel. The air cannot get out. Now let's talk about steps to uh, respiration. There are three steps to respiration, okay? There is the uh, pulmonary ventilation, the inhaling in and the exhaling out. Inhale in, exhale out. There's the diffusion of gases. Then there's the transportation of oxygen is carried into the cell and carbon dioxide is brought from the cell, you know, to the lungs. So um, let's talk about um, pulmonary ventilation. That's the act of inhaling and exhaling. Okay. The fusion of gases. Here is where O2 is actually passed into the blood and the CO2 is passed out of the blood. Remember, this is done in what type of blood vessels? Remember that. And there are capillaries that are wrapped around the alveoli or what we call the air sac, which makes this site of gas exchange very easy. Then we have transportation, which is the third step. Transportation is where the O2 is then carried to all of the cells and the CO2 is transported from the cells, okay? Now with pulmonary ventilation, it consists of two phases, right? When you are inhaling, this is an active phase of breathing. The respiratory muscles contract to enlarge the thoracic cavity to allow for this expansion. Other muscles which participate in inhalation are the intercostal muscles, right? What does inhalation work? What does it work? So as the cavity size increases, the pressure in the cavity decreases. When the pressure drops from below um, asthmatic pressure, air is drawn into the lungs. Basically, it's like a suction is being created. This is described as the, as the Boyle's Law, B-O-Y-L-E-S Law. You need to know the Boyle's Law. What I just told you, you need to know that, okay? Now let's talk about exhalation. Exhalation is passive, okay? It's the passive phase of breathing. It happens when the muscles relax and the air is rich in CO2, is forced out of the thoracic cavity. What muscles are involved? So the diaphragm is involved, the intercostal muscles, how y'all be like, we're going to look at the fifth intercostal space. Now you know. And the accessory muscles are involved. So the diaphragm is the chief muscle of respiration. The diaphragm. Kind of can see his. There you go. Um, it is the chief muscle of respiration. What is the diaphragm, my friends? Correct, young lady in the back. It is the chief muscle of respiration. Okay? The contraction and relaxation of the diaphragm causes air to be drawn into or pushed out of the lungs. Now, quick story time. I'm a labor delivery nurse, you guys know that. I've been that for a long time. I do it very sporadically now, because I'm a nurse entrepreneur. So babies come when they want. Anywho, I delivered a baby one time. It's my friend's child. She was a nurse as well. And she had very good prenatal care. 
Um, we were all friends, me, her, Nikki MacGyver, which you guys will meet later on when I start teaching maternity. Um, she's a midwife, but at the time she was a labor and delivery registered nurse like myself. Um, and Dr. Shivana, which was one of our really close friends who was the doctor to deliver her. Rocking and rolling, do to do. Labor is going great. Um, Jada decides to be born. <laughs> and she comes out and she takes a breath. <sighs> and she's pink and it's amazing. Almost immediately, Jada's tone went from pink to blue. We couldn't figure out what was happening. We're trying to resuscitate her while she's on um, my friend, I'm not going to say their names, her name, um, because we're all nurses and we know this is something respiratory going on. So we start to bag her, we get her intubated the whole nine. She's 39 weeks gestation. Come to find out, Jada was born without a diaphragm. I had never seen it before in my life. Understood before that how your body needs the diaphragm in order for respiration to work. Because she was not born with one, there was nothing to do this for her, right? Um, surgeries went on where we tried to, um, they tried to give her a false diaphragm make a diaphragm um, it did not work Jada did end up passing away after a couple of months of life um, but I used and tell that story for people to understand the importance of the diaphragm what the diaphragm does it is the chief muscle of respiration if you don't have it respirations will not likely occur for you so Let's talk about accessory muscles, all right? Accessory muscles include the abdominal muscles used to force uh, exhalation. These, uh, the use of accessory muscles to breathe should tell a person if someone is in distress as well. Because when, you, when they are using their accessory muscles to breathe, you know they're having difficulty with their respirations. Like um, children or like people who are having an asthma attack. When they are breathing, you see their stomachs going in, out, in, out. Like, <gasps> they're using all their accessory muscles just to breathe. Now, let's talk about intercostal muscles. These are located in between the ribs. All right? Now, we've talked about air trapping with patients who have emphysema, like they can't get the air out. Well, they have to use their accessory muscles to help get rid of the air, which is why they use those accessory muscles as well when they are breathing. Now let's talk about nerves, uh, okay, that supply respiratory muscles. Please know, please know that the firing of the purinic nerve P-H-R-E-N-I-C, nerve, stimulates the diaphragm to contract. You need to know the nerve that stimulates the diaphragm to contract, okay? P-H-R-E-N-I-C, nerve. The intercostal nerves supply the intercostal muscles. Inhalation um, as well. Next slide. Gas exchange of the alveoli. Let's talk about that just a tad bit. Sorry, guys. O2 moves from the alveoli into the pulmonary ca uh, capillaries. And COT moves from the pulmonary capillaries into the alveoli. Okay? There are so many alveoli that their collective surface area is about the size of the third of a tennis court. That much surface area. This favors gas exchange though. Any conditions that decrease the number of alveoli will also decrease gas exchange. O2 and CO2 must move across the alveoli for diffusion to happen. So when someone has atelectasis, it refers to the collapse of airless alveoli, right? We talked about that. So anything that blocks the movement of air into alveoli, like um, 
mucus or a tumor, okay, with, will cause some atelectasis. Deep breathing by post-operative patients help prevent this condition. This is one of the reasons why we have our clients to what we do, turn, cough, deep breathe. We want to expand, right, to keep that mucus out. Now we're going to go ahead and move on and talk about transport, transport of O2 and CO2 by the blood. The amount of each gas expressed as a parietal pressure is the PO2 and the PCO2. With, um, with severe anemia, there is a deficiency in hemoglobin, right? And therefore, this diminishes oxygen transport. This results in hypoxia, okay? So when you have an anemic patient, you have to think about this can affect their respir respiratory as well because we don't have enough blood cells, enough hemoglobin to capture and move this oxygen. O2, for O2, this is almost all transported as oxyhemoglobin. CO2, 70% of that is transported as bicarbonate, which is uh, HCO3. 20% is transported by um, carbinohemoglobin. And the last 10% is dissolved in plasma. Now let's talk about lung volume and the capabilities. So some examples of that are tidal volume, that's one. Tidal volume is the amount of air moved into or out of the lung with each breath. Another example is insp uh, inspiratory reserve. And that is additional volume of air after you take in a deep breath, that could be about 3000 mLs. Then we have ex respiratory reserve, and that is additional volume of air after you have exhaled, which could be like 1,100 mLs. Residual volume. Residual volume is after a forced exhalation, uh, about 1,200 mLs can remain in the lung. And then we have vital um, capacity, and that is the combination of the tidal volume the inspiratory reserve and the expiratory reserve. So that would equal 4,600 mLs. Deep space is some of the air that we inhale that never reaches the alveoli. That's called, sorry, dead space, dead space. It stays in the trachea and the bronchii and the bronchioles. When you rotate, wait. Oh yes. So when you guys do your rotations into uh, respiratory therapies, or for y'all who get to go to those um, areas when we're going to clinicals and things like that, um, you will hear these sounds, and I want you to know what you're talking about and what you're hearing. Okay. Another thing that you will see used often when you are dealing with respiratory therapy or post-operative care, but we like to teach it uh, pre-operatively, is how to use an incentive spirometer. An incentive spirometer is a device that measures pulmonary volume. It is often used after surgery or it is used for people who have any respiratory problems or respiratory therapies. This, my friend, show and tell, is a... Uh, incentive spirometer all right now you will notice that the incentive spirometer has measurements on it all right a lot of times we gauge where we want our client to sit at or we gauge where they were last all right 
this is the portion that they stick into their mouth okay and then we have to give them directions okay there are a couple of different type but um some of them we tell people to um use it like a straw right so inhale like suck in like you're using a straw there's others that sometimes they're tra trained to use where they're blowing into it exhaling okay now let's talk about control of breathing what controls the breathing so it is a neural function that controls the breathing so we have the um, neural part which is the medulla oblongata right it houses the inspiratory neurons and the expiratory neurons and the prawns all right so with the neural, the medulla oblongata fires rhythmically and stimulates the uh, perineuric nerve that we talked about and the intercostal nerves. This action by the inspiratory neuron is the starting point for inspiration. When the inspiratory neurons quiet down, the inspiration neurons fire off and inhaling um, initiating the exhalation things like opiates such as morphine um, these depress the respiratory function they are never administered without checking adequate respiration that's why when people miscalculate and they give too much morphine the client the patient goes into immediate respiratory failure <laughs> because you have suppressed um, that function, right? And that's another reason why, according to whatever the doctor order is, or whatever the mandate is, we will never give um, morphine if their respirations are not within normal limits. You wanna give them that and their respirations are 10? Eight? No, no. The primary regulator, um, let's back up, let me tell you something else. Um, yeah, so you never ever give morphine without checking um, and make sure they have an adequate respirations. The prawns control two centers that affect the rate of respiration, okay? Most narcotics slow down respirations. Cool, now let's talk about chemicals. The chemical receptors regulate the depth and um, the rate of inspiration. The primary regulator of respiration is PCO2, but the chemoreceptors are a sensitive to low concentration of CO2 in the blood. Sorry, low concentration of O2 in the blood. The level must be very low to trigger respirations. So this means you have high levels of CO2, so your body needs to blow it off by exhaling. Low levels of O2 are what makes a person with emphysema uh, breathe. That's why if you give them too much oxygen, you knock out their respiratory drive. That's why we do not like to give clients with emphysema more than like one to two liters of O2. We will knock out their drive. Now let's go ahead and let me talk to you about some terms. We have um, hyperventilation. That's rapid, deep respirations, which occur usually during an anxiety attack. <laughs> okay, so when that happens, it creates an increase in O2 levels and decrease in CO2. This increase in pH of blood will make them have um, alkalosis and it will result in them being very dizzy and very tingly. Breathing into a paper bag will increase the CO2 levels and alleviate the problem. Sometimes we don't have no bag. So what do you tell the people? You tell them to cup their hands right up to their face. So if you guys go ahead and do it right now, if you actually cup right Make sure you have a good seal and breathe in. You'll feel that, you know, that you're getting that air right back. 
Let's talk about hypoventilation. Hypoventilation is insufficient air as it enters into the lungs. The CO2 built up in the blood will then make oxidosis, okay? And the pH is decreased. This can call this can be caused by many things, many problems. This can also make problems. So if we notice hypoventilation, we want them to breathe um, better, breathing too slowly. Then we have hyper um, hyperpenia. This is an abnormal increase in the depth of the respirations. Like um, they are breathing more than 20 breaths a minute. Hypopenia is they have a decreased rate of rhythm, like less than 12, because normal, you know, is between 12 and 20. Uh, tachypenia, this is, <sighs> that's an increased rate of breathing. This can be normal if you're exercising, okay? But not just normal, you're walking around. Apnea, apnea is temporary lapse in breathing. Some people have sleep apnea, right? Those people are on the CPAP machines. When you have sleep apnea, the brain isn't receiving oxygen during the time of apne apneic episodes. Then we have dyspnea. Dyspnea is difficulty or labored breathing, shortness of breath, which you will see written as SOB. That is shortness of breath. And activity can cause that. Then we have orthopenia, that's difficulty in breathing, relieved by sitting up better, which would open up the lungs. Then we have chain stoking. Chain stoking is a sound that once you hear it, you will never not hear it. That's the sound of breathing that people normally make when they're at the end of life. People normally refer to it as the death rattle. Um, it happens normally when people are dying. It's a rhythmic pattern with alternating uh, apnea. Um, cyanosis is another term you need to be very clear of. It is the bluish color of the skin and the mucous membrane due to inadequate oxygenization. Hypoxia, this is um, below the normal of level of, uh, normal levels of O2 to the tissue. So if somebody's um, O2 stat is less than 92% or so, Hypoxemia, okay, that is uh, below the normal level of oxygen in arterial blood levels. Then we have Cushmol respirations. That is very deep, rapid respirations, which is characterized by acidosis, sometimes seen right before someone may die. More terms or disorders that I want you guys to make sure that you are understanding. We're almost done here. As influenza. Influenza is a disorder for the respiratory. Uh, influenza is the flu. It has various strains of circ and it circulates around um, all the time. Um, getting the flu increases the risk of you developing pneumonia. Uh, flu shots should be received by people who are high risk groups like children, elderly, people who work in the hospitals, or people who may be uh, immunosuppressed. Um, pneumonia, inflammation of the lungs in which the air spaces can become filled with fluid. This can be caused by several organisms, which is increased by in smokers people who have chronic respiratory disease and alcoholics. There are two kinds. There is bronchial pneumonia. This is infection that is scattered throughout the lung. And then we have low bar pneumonia. This is infection fills an entire lobe, okay? At, at one time. It is characteristic of pneumonia is uh, the formation of exudate and the alveoli. The patient may cough uh, up blood tinged sputum if the blood is present in the exudate. High risk people 
are young, like babies and old. Um, there is a mnemonic, a pneumonia vaccine that they give to people, um, and they give it to people who may be immunosuppressed or at a um, an age, a higher age category. Then we have asthma. Asthma is inflammation of the airway. It usually runs alongside with like hay fever or some seasonal um, patterns. What happens is, is the bronchial tubes will constrict and the airflow is decreased. Certain triggers can cause asthma, like smoke can cause asthma, dander can cause asthma, um, 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 roaches, you know, can cause asthma, pollen, feathers, or seasonal. Then we have COPD. COPD consists of several lung disease. Chronic bronchitis, lining of the airways can be inflamed. And um, y'all see, I'm, girl, what does that say? Yeah, can be inflamed and um, produce um, secretions. Or COPD can be emphysema, and that is dilation and destruction of the alveoli, and the air is usually trapped. Smoking is the number one cause of COPD, and it is a horrible way to go. Like, it is a horrible way to die. Um, if you guys have a straw, If you purse your lips across a straw and only breathe through that, child, I'm dizzy already. Try that. Try that. That is what it feels like when they have emphysema. Breathing through a straw all the time. You try breathing through a straw for one to two minutes and see how tired and lightheaded you get. It's hard. So I don't understand. <laughs> um, I mean, COPD. Um, emphysema is a loss of elasticity in the lungs. We call them the pink puffers. They're normally barrel chested uh, due to overinflation of their lungs. Pleurisy, that's another disorder or condition. It is inflammation of the pleural spaces, the pleural membranes causing friction. Remember, we talked about that. It could be painful when they breathe. And it could be caused by what, my friends? Dehydration, right. Pickwakians, uh, pick that is a syndrome related to obesity where the person um, hypoventilates, especially during their sleep. Then we have rails, rails or rattles or crackles. These are usually inspiratory. They normally sound like um, air flowing through closed air spaces. Then we have bronchi strider and wheezing. Um, we can make our mannequins do all of these breath sounds so that you can hear them. I'm gonna make a copy of this. It has um, the pink puffers on here and the blue bloaters to give you guys a better understanding. I'm gonna make, I think it's loaded though. I think I have it already loaded for you. Now, when you're performing an assessment of respiratory, you need to really make sure that you pay attention and document the rate, the depth, um, are they on on to, are they on O2? If they are, how much? What is their O2 saturation? Do their lung sounds clear or what? Are there crackles? Are there rails? What do you hear? Do they have a cough? If so, what is the characteristics of the cough? Is there any sputum when they cough? These are things that are very important when you are assessing their respiratory system and their lung sounds. I know that you guys did lung sounds already when we taught you guys vital signs, but now I hope that this helps you understand more what you're looking for, what you're listening for, why it's important to document it. You're also going to document if you notice that your client is having shortness of breath. 
or the um, rise and fall of the chest equal? Okay, is it an equal rise and fall or is it like not so much? These are things that must be documented as well. Now, me, please make sure that you pay attention to as we age, things start to reduce, okay? As you age, just like everything else in your body, our respiratory tract uh, decides uh, it wants to give up on it too. Just, you know, give out a little bit. The tissues become less elasticent. They become more rigid. These changes are gradual most of the time and the amount of activity can also t um, depend on their lung capability. Are they active or not? Some slight exercise um, eventually leads to a lot of work with breathing. We are also uh, at more risk of respiratory infection due to the changes in the immune system as we age because we have a lack of um, phagocytes. Um, emphysema is also an increased risk due to environmental irritants and smoking over a long lifespan. Then decreased activity also compounds with these problems. Exercising help keep the lungs stretched. It's like your skeletal muscles. If you don't use them, you will lose them. You must work them. So let's just do a couple of install type questions. Which of the following is true of respiratory structure? Okay. Is it true that gas exchange takes place across all structures of the lower respiratory tract? Is it true that the bronchioles do not collapse because they are large rings of cartilage that produces and provides structural support? Um, or the alveoli have the greatest surface area is that true of the respiratory structure or is it true that the alveoli have a thick layer of smooth muscle that determines airflow through the lower respiratory passages the answer is c which of the following is true of the respiratory structures it is true that the alveoli have the greatest surface area Remember how far I told you it could stress over the tennis court? Let's do another one, shall we? Sure, Miss Williams, why not? Um, activation of beta T adrenergic receptors and relaxation of bronchial smooth muscle does what? Does it increase thoracic volume? No. Does it decrease intrapleural pressure? That's in between the pleura and the visceral. No. Does it cause exhalation? No. Does it increase airflow to the alveoli? Yes. Activation of beta-2 adrenergic receptors and relaxation of bronchiolar smooth muscle increases airflow to the alveoli. Let's do another one. Contraction of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles do what? Does it increase intraplumaric pressure? Does it increase thoracic volume? Is, does it cause, is, wait a minute, is caused by the secretion of surfactant more than one of the above is true. Hmm. Contractions of the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles. Does it increase intrapulmonic pressure? No. Does it cause secretion of surfactant? No. Well, then we already know that that means that more of the more than one of these are not true. Does it increase thoracic volume? Yes. 
Last question. It's about vital capacity. Vital capacity is the same as total lung capacity. Vital capacity is measured during normal, quiet breathing. Vital capacity is also called tidal volume. Vital capacity is the maximum volume of air that can be exhaled during maximal inhalation. That is correct. So, that is the end of my respiratory lecture. For you, my friend. It was very interesting, right? It was great. Lungs. Have yourself a good pair. Try not to damage them. That is the end of this lecture. I'll be back with the next chapter.